Welcome to Haxby Shed and part 8 of servicing this Harrison Universal Milling Machine. Now this video is all about the electrical systems, rewiring the inverters on both the power side and the control side, getting the table switches working, setting the parameters, getting the speed controls working, setting up the interlock between the spindle and the table motor and all that stuff. Now I edited this up, it was well over an hour, it's quite detailed so I've split it into two parts, part 8 and part 9. And in the background I've finally got the bearings into this table motor, so the story of the table motor and its gearbox is going to be in part 10. Now just for interest's sake, I've tagged on a bit of video on the end, taken on my phone at the National Railway Museum in York. And at the end you'll just see a picture of my wife and my eldest daughter um, with the Duchess of Hamilton in the background. Oh, that's an engine, by the way. I hope you find it useful. We're in between Christmas and New Year, and it's pretty quiet. I'm waiting for a few things to come by post. But in the meantime, I've put this socket in next to the machine. Now, if you're not familiar with the UK, this is a 32 amp ring main, and each of these outlets are rated at 13 amps. In this plug, we've got a 13 amp wire link fuse, and as you probably know, um, over a short period, you can run that way over 13 amps, maybe even to 20. You're not supposed to, obviously, um, but I've been monitoring what this machine's been using, and even when it's freezing cold on a day like today, it won't draw more than about 12 amps. And in fact, I tried to start it when it was freezing on full speed, and the inverter over current tripped anyway. So I'm pretty confident I won't be running this over 13. When it steadies itself down, it runs back down to about 8 amps, something like that. I want to keep these original switches. These three don't work at the moment. And I'm thinking about how to rewire them. Now, because these are individual, that's fine. I can use one for the spindle motor and one for the table motor. But when it comes to this stop switch, I've got a problem. Because at the moment, um, it's only single pole. And I'll need double pole, so I've got to think about that, how that works, because I need separate control circuits for the two inverters. I've been working on this switch block from the milling table. I want to use the original buttons, but I need to wire in two inverters, and this is proving quite troublesome. Just getting it apart was quite a job, because one screw came out, the other screw was completely seized and it snapped off twice. I had to drill it out from here. Now in trying to get it all out, I cracked this body across here. Now luckily for me, uh, this is some kind of sintered ceramic and super glue glues that really well. But I've also added this pillar here to give it more support in the middle from this position here. Now, strange as it may sound, that took a bit of work. And then, you know, because some of it was finding screws the right length. Anyway, now I've kind of got that in. This will go here as a bracket. This plastic piece will go on here. And this will, this bit here will stop the button going so far. And then I've got two small micro switches because I need, this is only a single pole and I need at least double and I'm looking for triple. So, and it's the stop button normally closed. So I'm going to put those micro switches there such that when you press the button, there's a flat plate comes up and it'll press these in. Now, at this point, I'm waiting for some 2.5 millimeter screws, machine screws to come, which I've ordered quite a while ago, but we're in between Christmas and New Year. Everything seems to be going slowly. So I'll have to park that for a little bit. Now, to be honest, what I could have done I could have simply machined off these bosses here. I could have bored these out to 22 millimeters and put in normal start and stop switches, but I just wanted to try and keep it authentic. Was it worth the effort? Probably not, to be honest. There's about a day's work in this so far, you know, off and on, coffees in between. I've been waiting for more than a week now for the bearings and the seal for that table motor. So you can see everything's kind of laid up pending. So I've turned my attention to this and the switch front is off. I think you've just seen that. And here are the wires. Well, we need to rewire this 
for the control cables for the two inverters. Now those need to be screened. I added up some cable and this is supposed to be six core screened. Turns out to be four core. So the guy gave me my money back, but that was a waste of time. So I thought I'd buy some that was the same that I'd got for the shaper. I wanted seven meters. The guy had only got three, so that was a waste of time. So I thought, I'm going to stop messing about with these people. I'm going to go to a proper electrical wholesaler. I ordered some screen cable, which was described as eight core, which is fine. This is eight core. But this outer is supposed to be uh, about 5.6 millimeters. Well, it's almost nine. These cores are supposed to be 0.2 millimeter square. I've got a feeling they're at least 0.5. So they got the label right, the rest of it they got wrong. So I'm going to have to see if I can cut this back because I can't get two of these, I need one for each inverter, down this hole here and through this flexible um, tube at the back here, this braided tube. So I'm going to have to cut this rubber off. I could send, try and send this back, but then what would they send me, you know? Uh, it's like a lottery, you know, order one thing and goodness knows what arrives. So I'm going to cut that off. Uh, I'll leave it this on in the machine, in the body of the machine, but while it's in this um, braided tube that comes to here, uh, we'll just have the screen. And I think I can get two screens together because it's about six mil, just this screen. So that's what we're going to do. I've put a drawstring on the red, and if this comes off, I've got about 11 more chances. I've tied this off. This is a piece of washing line with a steel braid inside, so it's not going to break. And then I can pull the rest out now, hopefully. Now we're not going to pull out the green because that's the earth and we're leaving that one in. I've just cut a bit of the outer off on the ends of this cable. And yes, it looks like I can get just the two screens in there. It's funny stuff because it's not bonded on, it's just like a loose sleeve. So I just had to cut it round and I was able to pull it straight off. This is surprising. I need to strip this back by 1.4 meters. I just ran round it with a knife uh, without cutting the braid and literally you can just pull it straight off like this look. Well that was easy. I'll keep that tubing for something. Just temporarily I'm putting some heat shrink on the end of this braid and I've pulled the drawstring through one of them. And I'll let one of them run ahead of the other, probably like that. Okay, here goes. We're getting in there with this. Well, I think we are. That's it. So all the braid, as I screw this in, is at least covered with a heat shrink sleeve. And if I secure it well enough inside the machine, there shouldn't be any chafing on any sharp edges. Right, they're in finally. One end, other end. Just looking at this stuff here, hang on. This inverter, this panel goes on that way, look. Which means this inverter is upside down. Which means the fan on the inverter is probably acting against the heat flow. I mean, why would you put it on upside down? <laughs> and then these are wires that were left over, I think, from the switch block. Uh, they would have been uh, start-stop buttons for the main motor. And then this was from the suds pump. Anyway, we've got all this to sort out yet. I got a few bits in the post today. These micro switches you've already seen. I got this one as a backup. It's normally closed. You press it, it breaks these two lines, which is kind of what I want. But I'm thinking there's not enough travel on it. With this big red knob and this here, you know, it's not going to give me much movement on that switch, whereas you get a lot more on these. 
So I think this is still plan A and this is still the backup. I've got some screws to fasten these on with and I also managed to find a knob which is not a million miles away from what that original knob looks like. <clears throat> I've got the knob for this, for the table uh, motor reverse, but I don't have a knob for the suds pump. So trying to be close to original as I can be, it was difficult to find one which uh, took a square drive. This is 3 16 this is 5 millimeters. It goes on. <clears throat> I might be able to turn that. But to strengthen it, I'm going to fill this with epoxy. This is just two-part wood filler. Try and get it down inside there. It's cold today, so it shouldn't go off too quickly. Well, when that goes off, it should give it some strength and some weight. And then I can think about drilling a screw hole through because this is threaded. And the one on the suds pump is just the same. That's about where these two micro switches need to fasten onto this. And these are the screws to do it. And then I'll also drill through that aluminium angle bracket and it should hold it all together then. Well, I'm getting there drilling these four holes and getting them to line up with this bracket. But it's very difficult because this is very slippery stuff and there's no registration. Now I've drilled it on this piece of wood here and once I drill one hole I put a screw in and then this one and then I could drill these two using this as a template. I do hope all this lines up when I've finished. Well after a lot of work it's done. Hopefully you can see there's two micro switches there. And if I put my microphone down by the side, you should hear two distinct clicks. I better explain how I'm going to wire the control circuits for the inverters on the mill. Now this remote control box is on the lathe. I paid about £100 for it, so about $120 US. This display I added. The circuitry behind these buttons and this speed control is very simple and I'm just going to copy that. I'll show you a diagram. On the left here you can see the connections on the inverter. It's an IOMO Jaguar Cub inverter on the lathe and actually that's the same as the main inverter on the mill. So this is the speed control part here. A 10k linear pot like that one. Three connections and then you just have to tell the inverter to listen to this instead of the pot on the front panel. Common, PLC which is plus 24 and then the inputs to the inverter for forward and reverse. Normally closed, normally open and then we use a relay as a latch. So basically you press the green, the relay latches, provides power to the inverter through this control circuit, forward or reverse. Press the red and the power is dropped to this relay which drops the power uh, to the inverter. So it really is that simple. Now, because of the way the components are split on the milling machine, some will go into the table control box and some will go into the base. So on this diagram it's basically the same, but I've shown what's in the base and what's in the table. And this is for the main motor. It's slightly different for the table motor. And so between the table and the base you can see that you need one, two, three, four, five, six wires. Before I go much further I want to mount this inverter the right way up. Now it looks the right way there but when I close this lid it's upside down and it doesn't help the fan to be blowing against the natural flow of the heat. So you can see the fan there and all the crud that's built up on these fins. I've got it mounted. You have to take the cover off to get to the screws. It's a bit exposed inside. I think I said the one on my lathe is a generation later. This one looks a bit more like a prototype inside. So this is the cable that I want to use coming from the table control box. I've pulled back the braid. In fact, I made a hole in the braid and I pulled the cables out through. So there's the braid, which I've now put in an earth sleeve, and we're going to ground it at 
this end, we're not going to ground it at the other end. There's always a bit of a debate between the people in power and the people in electronics. Electronics might ground at both ends. The power people usually ground at one end because they're worried about earth loops. And in fact, the manual says ground at the one end. So we'll do that. We'll put some heat shrink over here. I'll just uh, fry that on in a second. But I've noticed actually some Japanese writing on this inverter, which I'm going to try and read because I can read a little bit. I'm just throwing this in as an interest item. I learnt a bit of Japanese. I can't speak it. I can do a little bit and I recognise a few characters. So you can see written in English, do not touch during power on. Well, this first character here represents a road or avenue, but it can also mean flow. The second character means electricity. So the top part actually is rain and the bottom part is dragon. Well, rain dragon is lightning, but in this context it means electricity. And the third character means middle or in between. So during the flow, and this part is the don't touch. Now, each one of these characters means something by itself. This script is phonetic, like we have A, B, C, D. So the shape of the character tells you how to say it. So, sawaruna, sawaruna, which actually means don't touch, like don't touch. If it was sawaranai, it would just be don't touch. Now with these, you can't tell from them, just looking at them, how to say them. And it's quite difficult because in Japanese, every one of these Chinese characters, kanji, has usually at least two readings. So this one on the end could be cho, or it could be naka, like nakayama, nakajima. So nakajima is uh, middle island. This could be uh, den for electricity, and this one I'm not sure. So anyway, that's it. <laughs> but it just interests me, that's all. I've connected up the three wires for the potentiometer to control the speed to terminals 11, 12 and 13. I'm using the same colour code as I got on the remote for the lathe and I showed you on that drawing. So yellow is the middle. I'm not sure about the green and the blue. I may have to swap them over if the pot doesn't work the right way around. Um, I've connected up the pot already but it's out of shot up there. So I'm going to have to program this thing now to work from this external potentiometer. So I need to look at the handbook for that. I've just powered it up and the knob on the front has a range of 100 down to zero. Now I think that must be percent. I don't think that can be 100 hertz because I don't think I was running the mill at double speed. That would be about, oh I don't know, uh, 3000 RPM at double speed. Hmm, maybe I should be uh, checking the speed of this, never mind. Let's turn it on. So they've set a maximum of 70 hertz, even though this says 100 here. There's two parameters and they both would have to be set to 100 to get 100, if you see what I'm trying to say. So that was spinning at 1.4 times 2,800. So they've set it to spin quite a bit more than the sort of basic speed. Now let's make the external potentiometer work. Oh, I should say I've got the belts off at the moment. We've got so much stuff exposed here, I didn't want the spindle spinning. So here's the pot wired in. And I've set the function on here, F01 to a value of 1, which means the inverter takes notice of this and not this anymore. So if I turn this, you should see these numbers changing. I'm not going to start the machine just now, but you get the idea. I'm just changing it from here now. So that much is working. I've just wired in the reverser switch to test it. So I'm using the same wiring colours that I've got on the remote control on my lathe still. So white is forward, grey is reverse. This is just plus 24 for now. And it comes to this uh, changeover switch and the one with the loop takes the common and then simply A was forward and B was reverse. Now I have tested it, it does work. There isn't much point showing you that. 
But that's how easy it was to wire this in. And yet they used a switch that was here, added a switch to do it, in fact. I can't really understand why. And clearly they never used the machine in reverse. So what does that mean? Does that mean they were only ever doing vertical milling and only with end mills? I don't know, but you certainly need it for horizontal milling. Now I have to wire up in the control box on the table, uh, replace this with which something uh, comes from the latch, the power from the latch. The relay, in other words. I'd better explain the circuitry that goes into the control box on the table, the switch box, and everything to do with this relay, this latch. Now I find this circuit really hard to understand, but I hope I can explain it to you. So here we've got the relay, and we're picking up on the normally open contacts on that relay, and there's the coil. One side of the coil goes to common, the other side is fed from plus 24, coming through your normally closed stop switch. One side goes to a relay switch terminal. The other side goes to the green normally open button. When you press that button, power is fed to the other side of the coil. So this coil is energized. This switch closes. Once that switch is closed, it's taking power from here. And that's keeping the relay coil energized, but it also feeds down and goes off to the inverter for your forward and reverse switch, which is in the base. Now when you press this normally closed switch, it opens and then power is cut to all of this and the relay drops to its normal off position. So this is then open and then it awaits pressing the green again to re-energize the coil and complete, complete the circuit. So what does all that look like physically? Well, we've got our normally closed stop switches here. This, is, this red is plus 24 coming in from the inverter, going through this switch here, goes off to this top switch which is uh, normally open, which is the start switch, and then feeds off to one of the switch terminals on the relay. This brown is the common, which goes to the other side of the coil on the relay, and then the far side of this start switch goes to the two terminals here on the relay and this one is the feed, the purple, going back to the forward and reverse switch which is in the base. Now if I turn this on, you just all you'd hear is this little click going in here and you'd hear the noise of the inverter so there's not a lot to be gained by listening to it. But you know, that's all it is. I'll have to find some way of securing this inside this box. It might be as simple as a bit of silicon and stick it to the side. I've done that before. Anyway, that's all it is. Now we'll need to repeat with this cable, this set of cables, for the table motor. But the inverter for the table motor is a bit different. And uh, I don't even know if we're going to need this relay because when I look at the diagram for this inverter, the one on the end of this cable obviously, um, it seems to have a latching switch and momentary uh, switch terminals anyway. So I might not need this relay, but I do have a second one. So I'll tell you what, I will just show you. Relay, so spindle, stop, and again, and stop. That's it. Well, I need to decide where to put this thing as well. And I've thought about it. Up here could get coolant on it. Over here is a bit awkward to get to. Underneath is a no-no because of the coolant. So I'm thinking on here. Now that could get swiped off because that pot is quite delicate. If it's sticking through there with a knob, you know, you could smash that off easily. But my idea is to use something like this, which is a Tupperware box. It's sealed. Okay. And I could get two pots in there. That would go on the side like that. Now I wouldn't have to decide straight away. I can put my two pots on as long as they're close enough together and then decide whether to add that box. I don't have to have the front on it. I could just use it like a shield, take these bits off. If I didn't do that, I could just have some metal angle coming out just as protectors. Lots of ideas. I've rewired the main motor with screened cable so that's coming in here. So this is the stuff I'm talking about. That's coming in here. I've made this wooden bridge here and it's got a hole in it so that the fan 
and the airflow for this is going to work okay. And then this is the control cable coming in from the table. So being wood, I've just been able to put these cable clips on to hold it all secure. That was the operating switch for the table motor. But I don't want to disconnect it until I've got this inverter out, got it on the floor and just see how it's wired. That'll be the next step. At the York National Railway Museum, Mallard. This is by far my favourite train, the Shinkansen. Now, there's a video that plays on here and I could sit all afternoon just watching the video over and over again. Absolutely love it. This is a nice cutaway section of a train. I shouldn't say train, should I? I should say engine. Lovely pipework. It's as dark as anything in here, so I don't know how this will come out. <laughs> 